All right, so thank you for doing those uh, student ratings of your instructor. Uh, it's really important for me. Um, the exam next week, just over 60% of it is on this week and last week. So the team models and current issues that we covered last week, and then pediatrics and geriatrics that we're covering today. Uh, so roughly 60% of the questions will be covering those two things. And then just under 40% will be all of the previous material that we covered. Um, it's 60 questions, so it's a little bit longer than your other exams that we've had in this class. Not by too much, but a little bit more. Um, there is a timer on it. I believe it's 100 minutes, so just over an hour and a half for those 60 questions. I think it's plenty of time. Um, if you have concerns, come and talk to me, send me an email and, you know, I want to make sure you're happy when, when you're taking this and um, able to take it in a reasonable manner. Um, we'll open the floor. Any questions, any other questions? All right, let's dive into the material. We'll see where we go from there. All right, so uh, oh, I gotta do that. There we go. So here's our objectives, uh, slightly different for the pediatrics versus geriatrics that we're gonna cover. So pediatrics typically means anywhere from birth to 21 years old. Although some conditions you can you can treat older than 21 years old and still be considered pediatrics. Um, it's fairly unique. Um, so the typical conditions that kids will need physical therapy for is injury before, during, or after childbirth. Most commonly is cerebral palsy. Occasionally during the birthing process, there could be other physical injuries, broken limbs. Um, there's a herbs palsy, which is a, a nerve related injury in the arm when they yank the kid out. Um, th there's a handful of other injuries that can happen through that birthing process that might need physical therapy. Uh, there could be genetic disorders. We'll talk about Down syndrome. There's a lot of genetic disorders that we could talk about. Um, and then potentially some environmental factors too, like asthma. Um, we can see that in city areas where the air quality isn't as good, that there's more cases of things like asthma. So um, something else to consider. The unique thing about pediatrics is the child is growing. So how their uh, disease or injury is impacting them is going to change over time. Versus adults, it's, okay, you have the broken leg. Let's use that example. You have the broken leg. It's going to heal. You need a handful of weeks. We'll move on from there. Here's a cast. Come back in eight weeks. Well, what happens with the kid if we put a cast on somebody and don't see them again for eight weeks? First of all, can kids grow in eight weeks? Heck yeah, right? So all of a sudden that cast doesn't fit anymore because the kid's growing. So there's uh, some unique considerations because that child is changing where adults, I mean, we're maybe internally we can change, right? But, uh, you know, physically it's tougher and tougher too. Um, so that's a unique person, a uh, unique difference to consider how this condition is going to change that person over time. Um, another example on how that's going to change over time. Let's, uh, there's a condition that we'll just mention briefly spina bifida. There's a few different severities of it. One of the severities is that, uh, the child can't use their legs and won't, won't ever use their legs. Well, as an infant, not a big deal carry the infant around but what's going to happen to that infant they're going to grow and grow and grow right so my wife actually had a similar case to this where um the family lived on a third story apartment was carrying the child up and down all those flights of stairs handful of years not a big deal but now the kid's 10 and big and the mom is tiny 
she's the one that gets home, gets the kid from school and takes him home. Now the mom is suffering from a lot of physical injuries from hauling this kid up and down the stairs. So part of what our job is in the pediatric world is to think way in the future. That living environment should have been started to be addressed years before it became a problem. Um, doesn't mean every solution is easy. I'm not saying that, but um, that shouldn't have been a surprise for this family. Um, so that's an interesting thing to think about. Now, the thing we have to also consider with pediatrics is the gross motor development. Now, there's a lot of other things that we could look at with pediatrics, but in the physical therapy world, we're mostly going to be focused on the gross motor. So it's important for us to understand the typical milestones that the child would progress through and, and at what approximate timeline they should do that. So that includes rolling over at about five months. There's a range of normal, could be three months, could be, you know, seven or eight months, but, you know, around the five month mark, that child should be rolling over. Uh, walking, roughly 12 months, could be as early as eight months, could be as late as 18 months. Uh, but, you know, somewhere around that 12 month mark, we should be progressing close to walking. If we're not, that's when physical therapy needs to start working with these kids to help try to achieve that next motor milestone. Other examples, uh, crawling, self-feeding, talking, dressing yourselves, those are all different developmental milestones that we could be talking about. And uh, we have a handful of parents in here, right? Um, you know, the, the kids growing is such a bittersweet process. Um, it's pretty fun when we don't have to feed our kids anymore, right? When they can grab Cheerios and put it in their own mouth and we can just say, yeah, here's a pile of Cheerios and I'm going to go over here now for a little bit. Like, that's a pretty sweet moment. Um, same thing when they can dress themselves or brush their own. Like, all of these tasks is really nice to have a kid start taking on for themselves. Well, I think part of the things that we should be considering in is achieving that next milestone and what that does for the family and it, how important it is for that family, not only for the developing child, but also the impact it makes for the family. Um, so when a child is behind in their motor development, the PT is aimed at achieving that next milestone. It's very important to progress through this development because you guys know what Wolf's Law is? Have you talked about that in physiology? So Wolf's Law is the body will adapt depending on the forces that it's placed upon. That's why when we lift weights, we get stronger. That's why when we, if you choose to, I don't know why anybody would choose to. Anybody a runner here? Crazy. Um, at least yeah, I'm only running if somebody's chasing me. I'm not mm -hmm. running. And you know what? I hope I'm running with somebody slower than me because I'm probably just going to trip them and just mosey from there on out. Uh, um. But the reason why when we run, we have better cardiovascular dis endurance and we can run farther the next time is because of this Wolf's Law. Um, you guys in anatomy did learn all of the bumps and tubercles and, and tubrosities, right, in, in anatomy. You know all of those, right? Why do those, why does a tibial tubrosity exist? Because the, which muscle inserts to it? No. Nope. nope. You're closer though. No, not tib anterior. A little higher. It's a big strong one. Quads, Quads right? So the, the patella tendon attaches to the tibial tuberosity. So the reason why that tibial tuberosity is that bump is because we use our quads. The quads attach to the bone, and the bone grows more in that specific spot to withstand the additional stresses that other parts of the bone don't have to, uh, to um, withstand. That's every single tendon insertion to a bone. There's a lump associated with it because of that's where that's pulling on the bone, right? Deltoid tuberosity, what attaches, what, what's important about the deltoid tuberosity, what attaches there? Deltoid, right? I mean, some of them are named pretty easy. Um, but yeah, that's every single you know, uh, bump on a bone that you had to learn the name of at some point. That's the reason for it. So, do you have a question? With that, Wolf's Law, we're just 
talking about that mom was carrying her kid up the stairs. Yeah. Did that just get past her, or was she like? No, if, but if she's carrying the kid up every day, should it be like? Well, kind of progressively overloading that. Boy, place. that's a great that's a great question. How come this mom had trouble carrying this child up the stairs, even though like they um that is progressive overload, right? Why is she having trouble? Uh I don't I haven't seen her. So I'm getting the story from someone else. It could be form. But also at a certain point, if she's if the mom is 104 pounds and the child is 130 pounds. Uh, yeah, going, you know, max, maxing out every single time, eventually that's going to break down. And she has to do it multiple times a day, right? So, um, yeah, really tough. But you're right that that I there was a time this woman was getting stronger and stronger because of it. And then eventually the load become too much. Um, so. But not only all of those those muscle insertions to the bones, the bones need to go. Also, the, just the ability of weight bearing on those bones, grow the bones, right? And grow the bones. And you guys saw when you were looking at the anatomy, the pattern of the bones. If you chop a bone in half and you look at the pattern of where all the, the lines of inside the bones, right? And how it's structured. All of those exist because of the forces that are placed upon it. So if we don't get kids developing in the right sequence and at close to the right times, their structures, muscles and bones are now at risk of not developing in the proper sequence and, and having more problems along the way. Yeah. What happens if a kid has an ear infection and he can't walk? Oh, okay. All right. So, I mean, if there's a, a short term, you know, kid is sick, he can't walk for a little while, a couple of weeks isn't going to make a big change. But over time, if it's months and years, now that's where we have to be concerned of, are they going to be growing appropriately? Um, here's another example of this, both Wolf's Law and also pediatric. Um, anybody have a flat spot on their head? I got a little one. Anybody? Um, any of any of our kids, I know my wife is so being a pediatric PT, she is very proud of the shape of our kids' heads. Why do we develop flat spots on spots of our heads? Because when we're growing, we sleep in the same position or we were left on our backs for every single time we slept, and our skulls just developed in that shape. Isn't that crazy? So if you ever see somebody, maybe you're in the back row and you're looking at everybody's heads now. Uh, if you ever see somebody with a flat spot, you can say like, hey, uh, you tell your parents that they should have spun you around a little bit more when you were a kid. Um, so, but that's a perfect example. I mean, we can see, let's see if we can find a picture of this. That's uh, different from a uh, soft spot. A flat spot. Yes, the soft spot is... Um, There we go. Well, there's that flat head right there. You can see that. Um, so that soft spot in the center of the skull is just because the bones haven't formed yet. That will close over time. I forget exactly which month that's that's uh, fontanelle that's supposed to close. Could be. I. I. Yeah. There you go. Look at that. It's a good one. There you go. It's a good one. There you go. There's the helmet right there, right? So yes, if it progresses, you could potentially need to require uh, use one of those helmets. That uh, so that's a great question. Who prescribes the head, the helmet, the headpiece? Um, most of the time. It's the pediatrician or a physical therapist that says, hey, we got this head is a little flat right here. Um, and then the team, including the pediatrician, looks at it and maybe ortho looks at it and says, OK, this is severe enough where we need corrective helmets. Uh, it's a team decision. Uh, but a lot of times it's picked up first by the PT.
Yeah. And actually, if we kind of think of kids who aren't progressing through this normal growth, uh, gross motor de development, they're not crawling at the stage that they should be. They're not rolling over the stage. They're staying in that position even longer. They're, they're at greater risk of these skull mal, I don't know if malformations, that might not be the exact word, but, um, improper development. Um, yeah, they're at greater risk. And that's typically why PT picks up on it. They're sent to us because, hey, this kid's not rolling over yet. The PT, one of the first things they'll screen is the skull and say, okay, well, we need to get them rolling over because that'll help the skull because now they the child chooses where they're going to be. Um, but also, we shouldn't be addressing this too. So I do have a couple of laws for us uh, for uh, pediatrics. First, it was in 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, uh, entitled children ages 6 to 21 years old, regardless of disability, to a free and appropriate public education. Um, supportive services like PT was not required by public education um, at that point. And then in 2004, Individual Disabilities Act extended the concept of access to quality education, also requires supportive services beginning at birth. So now this, this law said, okay, well, we're missing a lot of people. Man, if we could catch these kids before they're six years old, we're going to be preventing a lot of problems. So um, that opened up. And also care is to be uh, required to be in the least restrictive environment. So... Um, I got to say, I, you know, I graduated high school in 2002 and there was a special ed classroom where all, all the special needs kids had their education in that room. And every now and again, they'd go around the school and do other things. I remember I had a phys ed class with that exact group. Um, but now the goal is to get all of the kids in this is an, an imperfect term, but typical classrooms, it's an imperfect term. Um, but being with their peers, being if they're a first grader, should be in a first grade classroom, not the special ed room. Um, and I bet you anybody who went to school, how many people were born into 2000s? So you guys uh, give me some feedback. Do you guys go to school with kids with special needs right in your classroom all throughout your education? No, and you went to which school did which high school did you? Davies. Okay, so that might be a little different. Um, what about you guys? Did, did you, middle school, you noticed it all the all the time. Um, yeah, I mean. Man, I, I don't feel like I'm a lot older than you. Maybe I, maybe this is, um, yeah. For, for when I in all my education, nope, special ed room, they're down that way. Um, where now it's assumed that they're going to be in the first grade classroom, second, whatever grade they're in. Um, with some exceptions there. I mean, how we define least restrictive environment depends a lot on the kid. There still are special ed classrooms. Don't get me wrong, but um. They should be with the rest of their peers as much as possible. Um, high school, it might be a little different because one of the goals of the high school team with the kid with special needs is what are they going to be after high school? And we should start job training now for whatever that career might be. Um, and there's a whole lot of options there. So that could be part of the reason why that it's less common in the high school ranks. Um, I hope my wife doesn't watch this video because she'll probably be correcting me left and right on a bunch of things I'm saying. Um, but anyway, that's what the least restrictive environment should be. Now, the other thing that is very sad and it is something that we have to be aware of is that we are re mandated reporters when there are questions of abuse. Uh, questions of abuse, both with pediatrics and geriatrics, we are mandated reporters. If there's signs, we have to report. It is not a should I or should I not. Different than domestic violence. Domestic violence, it's actually suggested not to report because 
and this is what I've learned from uh, domestic violence advocates is if we get it wrong or if the cops show up and there's not enough evidence when the cop leaves, now there's an opportunity for an escalation of instances rather than uh, a solution of a problem. Um, so, but for suspicion of child abuse and geriatrics, uh, we are um, mandated reporters. So treatment of pediatrics, number one, treatments have to be fun. Do you have kids? You said you had kids coming to your clinic every now and again, right? Yeah, probably. Oh, wow. That's a pretty sizable one out of 10 is a sizable pediatric population. Uh, you're a tech as well. Do you have P do you have kids coming into your clinic every now and again? Not really. Yeah. Any other texts or, or aids that? So um, describe to me the typical treatment for a kid versus an adult in you. Yeah. Yeah. Different than like the uh, pass and fall. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, active, highly engaged. Also, uh, it, no rest breaks. Like, because if you give a kid a rest break, then they're just gone. Like, you got to. Once you capture that attention, you got to use that attention and you know don't let it go. Also, really bad. Out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The Lots the of instruction. Yeah, like, they're gonna do something wrong, so they're doing stuff like so slow. Yeah. 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 Um. So, because uh, typically pediatric care is, is delivered one on one and not multiple people at a time like adults can be, uh, but the treatments have to be fun. You are not going to get a kid to lay on a table and do leg ex knee extensions. That's not happening. But you could sit them on a table and have them kick a soccer ball back and forth to you. So you're getting the same output that you're at, you're hoping for, but you're using fun to do it. Uh, my wife, uh, again, pediatric PT has been her whole career. Ask her how her day is. She sometimes just says, I play connect more all day. I, how bad of a day can I have? And by the way, she's an ass kicker at connect four. I, I will not play connect four with my wife because she just annihilates me. Um, but she plays connect four with her her students and patients laying on their belly because they need more tummy time standing in a stander because, you know, they get strapped into these standards and they get to be upright. And um, I'll show you what those look like. Five grand for that. You could build one cheaper, right? So there you go. There's a stander. Kid gets strapped in everywhere, and now they get to be weight bearing, right? So, I mean, why why is weight bearing for this child? I mean, she can't stand on her own. So why would we spend five grand on this stander? What's that? No. Builds muscle, builds bone, helps develop all of that appropriately. We're fighting gravity. There's so many benefits we get to standing. So my wife says, okay, this kid hates being in the standard. It's uncomfortable. It's work, but we're going to put you in this standard. We'll play connect four for the next 20 minutes or we'll call her or we'll do whatever else that the kid is interested in. Um, so oh, look at that. Thanks, Ryan. Should we ask him any questions? No, skip that. Um, so it's got to be fun. You have to find a way to have fun. Now, if I'm going to be critical of all physical therapists, I think we lose a lot of our patients because all of our treatments should be fun. If all of our treatments are just a little bit more fun, I think our patients would keep coming back to us and look forward to coming to us and maybe not be afraid to exercise. Maybe they might look forward to coming to our place instead of just saying, I got to go in there and do the same damn 12 exercise I always do, right? So um, I, I am on a challenge to always be having fun. Um, with my sessions. Um, the other thing that's important to consider is the whole family is our patient. Yeah, the, the child is our patient. We're going to be doing all the things to the child, but the impact is to the whole family. Um, you know, parents definitely 
siblings, a hundred percent. Other caregivers potentially, but definitely parents and, and siblings. Um, because if we got to bring little Susie to PT at six o'clock, right down the road at Hasbro, guess who's coming with them? Their siblings, right? Does the siblings want to go there, sit in a waiting room for an hour? No. So the most PDPTs and PTAs will say, okay, for the first 20 minutes, there's just me and them. The next 20 minutes, let's bring in your siblings so we can have fun together and we can have this new game and maybe you guys play that game on your own and um, when you get home. So uh, that's really fun when we get to start incorporating that. Also, teaching parents the importance of these positionings and how do you stretch? I'm so afraid to touch my child. Like they're, they feel so fragile. No, no, we can do this and we can put this amount of force with them. So really a lot of education goes towards the family and not just the kid. And also, if we think about it, the impact of having a kid go through these milestones and feed themselves frees up. It impacts the family in such great ways. Um, my my wife gets to come home and cry in tears because her patients took their first steps. They're four years old and finally took their first steps. And everybody's crying because we never thought that it happened. Like, it's incredibly powerful when we get to do that kind of stuff. Did you have a question? At 10 years old, you went with P to PT with your brother. And look at that. Um, do you mind sharing what he was going to PT for? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Wow. How long ago was this? Wow. Because I was saying, we when I... I guess I'm a lot older than I think. I've come to the realization I'm a lot older than what I think I am. Because PT for concussions is relatively new. I was going to say within the last 10-ish years. Because um, even when I graduated grad school, it was like a little bit of a thing. But now it's very common. So, Well, I'm going to cry in the drive home today, I guess. That's the, <laughs> that's the end of that. But pretty great that you got to be involved in it. It changed your perspective on the world and gave you a direction. That's pretty great. Um, so the treatments are aimed at achieving that next motor milestone, whatever that next missing milestone is. Um, and, but the other thing is improving participation with their feet, their peers. How do we participate in school? How do we participate in recess? How do we participate in the playground and other play things, other recreational things? So, that is such the focus. Yeah, the 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 textbook will say, okay, we need to do the next milestone. It should be at this month. We're this old. We'll do that. But the reason why we do it is to improve interaction with the peers. Is that that much different than improve current level of function with adults? Because what's function for kids? Playing. Right. And yeah, sometimes they play at school. Sometimes they play at recess. Sometimes they play after school in the playground, in the park, whatever it might be. But playing with other kids is the function of kids. Uh, so that's what, you know, we 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 call it different things. Right. In participation with peers. That's no different than current level of function, maximizing current level of function. It's the same thing. We're just talking about kids instead of adults. Um, we care about how do they function in school rather than can you go back to work. It's all the same stuff. You're just swapping out one word or one activity for another, but it's all the same broad premise. So we've got a couple of tests we can look at. Um, the challenge with kids, though, is a lot of tests we can perform on kid, on adults. We can't reliably perform on kids. First of all, how easy is it for adults to follow directions? It can be really tough, right? Um, now, how easy is it for kids to follow directions? I told you to clean up your room. Anybody ever tell, and maybe maybe you can think of when you were a kid, if you're 20 or something, like if you were born in the 2000s. Um, 
I know I did this and I know my kids do this. Hey, can you clean up your room? Yeah, no problem. And you look and all of the stuff that's on the floor is just pushed into a pile and not like put away. Right. How many, I don't know if you did that as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I cleaned it up. It's all in that pile. Um, so, you know, how we instruct a kid and how they interpret it can be very, very different. So some of our tests, so our four-way jump test, remember that way back from week, I think that was week two we did that, right? So jump, turn, jump, turn, jump, turn, right? Um, do you think a kid can do that test reliably? Probably not. And especially if they start getting goofy and silly and now they're pretending they're falling all over the place. That, like, it's just not as reliable as we'd like. Um, but one of the tests we can use to measure limb length is just touch the palpate, the ASIS, take a tape measure, put it there, and run it down the leg to the medial malleolus. So if we do that, we can measure right to left limb length, and we can see is, is one limb growing at a faster rate than the other. That test is reliable as kids because they, don't, they just have to lay down. And if they're fidgety or crying or something, then we just can't do it. Next time they come in, we can, right? But that test doesn't require the patient to do anything. So that test would be fine to use in kids and adults versus the four-way hop test with kids. It's just not going to be quite as good. Um, so that's a consideration when we're testing kids for anything. Now, unique to the pediatric population is going to be the gross motor development. So the gross motor testing, the most common one, there's a lot of different ones. The one that I want to talk about is the Peabody gross motor scale. It comes in a big box. Comes in a big box, gives you a bunch of tools. There we go. There's the there's the whole big setup right there. All right, it's a big box, couple of instruction manuals, couple of tools for you. Um, it is off the top of my head, and you don't need to know these numbers, but off the top of my head, it's 128 different tasks you could have the kid do. Now, we would never make the kid do 128 tasks. That would take seven months to run through it. But what it is is you get to test the kid with this activity. They either can or can't do it. If they can, then you move in this direction and do this next activity. If they can't, then you move in this direction and do an easier activity. Um, and at the end of it, you get a number for how the kid is developing. Kids at this age should be at this number. This child is at this number. They've got 14 points to go. I'm just making that up. Um, but it's a pretty good test. And once you're trained and good at it, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes up to an hour for the test to do. So it is a lot, um, but it's great. And it, it, I mean, gosh, you, you could use it from any age. It could ask you, uh, can the child roll over? Can they throw a ball with one hand? Do they need two hands? Um, can they uh, run? Can they gallop? You guys know what galloping is for kids, right? So that's like not quite skipping in here. Um, so, a whole bunch of stuff it can ask you to do. Uh, and it gives you a lot of data for how that kid's gross motor development is. Now, the other thing with pediatrics that would be important and part of the development of the child is testing reflexes. What reflexes do you guys know? Knee and elbow, right? So you sit on the docks, they whack your knee, your knee extends, and you say, okay, there's your reflex. And we have a bunch of reflexes. Some reflexes we grow out of and others we grow into. So uh, a reflex we grow out of, actually these next two we grow out of, the rooting reflex, and I like this word, Bibinski. I like just saying that, so I think that one to talk about. So the rooting reflex is for an infant, if you stroke their cheek, they're going to turn to that stimulus and open their mouth to feed. And we grow out of that, I forget exactly what age. I'm not a pediatric therapist, and I didn't bother looking it up. But we grow out of that. And it's good to have it when we're an infant, because when 
you know, historically mom, although as a dad and I'm bottle feeding, I get, I get to learn this trick. Hey, it's just a little nuzzle on their cheek and they're going to take the bottle easier than me just trying to shove it into the mouth. Right. Um, it's good to have that reflex as a baby. Hey, time to eat. I'm here. Let's go. It's also good that we grow out of it because it'd be really weird if we went around tickling people's cheeks and they said, oh, burger, like <laughs> lunchtime. Like it, it's good that we grow out of that. So the pediatric therapist can also look at the kid and do some of this reflex testing and say, OK, they're also behind on their reflex development for either growing in or growing out. of. This Babinski is good one. Um, this is stroking on the bottom of the foot and across the toes and um, the toes would curl. We grow out of that test. And actually, if we if any of us shows up at the ER unconscious, this is the number one test that they this is the first test that they do to test brain integrity. Because if we start displaying that in kids, it's normal and then we grow out of it. In adults, if we show up at the ER unconscious, they do this test, it's a sign that there's some sort of brain injury. It's a neurological reflex. So um those are, are just a couple of examples of reflexes that are okay as a kid that we grow out of. Did you have a question? Tickled. Um, I don't know much about the reflex of, of tickling. Although, I mean, the basic reflex is, I mean, that, that, um, the knee jerk, the reflex, the, the, that's the uh, easy one to look at. There's also reflexes of if I step on something damaging, my what's going to happen? I'm going to pull my foot away from the painful thing, right? Um, so there are some of those reflexes too um, that we need a bunch of neurological components to it. I don't want to get too deep into it. Cause... Yeah, all right, good, good. Um, but there's a bunch of reflexes we have in the body that are, are pretty cool. All right. Any questions on either the Peabody gross motor test or why reflexes are important for the pediatric PT? All right. So a couple of, uh, disorders we want to talk about. First up, cerebral palsy, really common one in the pediatric world. There's a brain injury, decreased oxygen to the brain, either before, during, or shortly after birth. That decreased oxygen kills brain cells, and now we have impaired cognition because of it. Now, I shouldn't say cognition. Um, cognition has to do with how we think. It's not always how we think. Sometimes it's just how we move. It just depends on the location of and severity of, of that decreased oxygen um it's a static condition but it is lifelong yep i haven't heard conversation about it being progressive tell me more of what you've heard okay okay interesting uh, yeah i haven't heard of that at all um so pretty interesting um Anyway, so the impairments can range from slight tightness in one muscle. That, that could all be – um, I, I know of a few people that uh, – actually, one of my former students had CP, and, and he had one limb was just really, really tight. He walked on his toes, and he had a little different gait pattern, different walking pattern than because of it. That's all it was. Um, others have significant changes to tone, motor control, balance. Persistent primitive reflexes. So those are the reflexes we were talking about. Like primitive reflexes means like the Babinski staying on, staying positive for a while. Um, it can also include cognitive deficits, uh, visual and hearing deficits too, depending on the severity of how long the oxygen was reduced to the brain. So the treatment, the number one thing we're going to do is prevent secondary complications. That's the number one thing we have to do. Um we would also try to improve gross motor development, gait training, potentially pain management, 
and then bracing or casting to improve proper musculoskeletal development as well. Um, casting is, we talked about it just a little bit. Um, in some pediatric cases, and CP could be one of them, uh, we call it serial casting. So when somebody's gas rocks are really tight, and then maybe that's the reason why they walk on their toes, what we can do is we can stretch the gas rocks and then cast the person, put them in a cast. And then next week, cut the cast off, stretch them a little bit more, put them in a cast. Next week, cut it off, stretch them a little bit more, put them in another cast. So that's just a slow stretch over time, and the cast holds that person in the stretch. Um, so that's that's serial casting. That's where that helps. Yeah. In the, uh, in the, in the cerebral palsy, that was like, yeah, those dual crutches and couldn't walk right. Now the deadlift's like one side down. No, I haven't seen so that. Like, he has to get them like where he can like engage his muscles. And once they're engaged, it's like you push the bar up like it's, there's nothing on the bottom. Just, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so the first step would be preventing secondary complications and then approving the uh, gross motor development after that. Next thing we'll talk about is Down syndrome, also known as trisomy 21. Uh, it's a chromosomal abnormality now, so it's not an acquired injury or problem. It's, it's a genetic one. There's an extra copy of the 21st chromosome. So instead of having two copies, one from each parent, for some reason, this they develop a third. Um, it's a static condition. It is lifelong. There is classic facial features. Let's look at this. So classic facial facial uh, features. This is one of those conditions as as you um, as you work more and more with kids and and people with Down syndrome, you can spot it from across the room. Like that. actually, when I was typing up this this uh presentation i was sitting in a coffee shop and there were um there was a group of special needs adults came into the coffee shop and uh, as i was typing these classic facial features I, I was like staring at one of the the gentlemen who had down syndrome i said oh this is it um yeah i spotted from my way and actually a lot of pediatric nurses midwives um OBGYNs, when they deliver a child, they can just look at the child and, okay, this person, we'll go get the test done, but this child has Down syndrome. Uh, so, so classic features uh, are flattened facial appearance, outside corners of eyes slant upwards, smaller ears, shorter neck, lower tone. Do you guys know what tone is? It's a kind of a weird concept. So, Muscle tone has nothing to do with the amount of muscle mass you have. Muscle tone is how much contraction is that muscle under at rest? So let's think of it this way. So it's cold outside today, right? So when we step outside from this classroom later today in an hour or so, what are we all going to do when we step outside? Let's say it's really windy too. It's Right. All right. So what, that's high tone. What do we feel like and wh what is our general appearance when it's uh, 90 degrees and humid in the middle of summer? Ugh, right. That's low tone. All right. So our tone can change because of environment or our tone can change depending on other conditions. Um, Down syndrome is a low tone disorder. Our athletes that have Down syndrome have high risk of joint dislocations. And actually, we um, combat and, and collision type sports like football are contraindicated because we, there's, there's a certain section in the spine that's really at risk of, of causing a spinal cord injury. You guys know the DENS, C1 and C2? There's a little ligament that holds the dens in place. If that ligament is lax and we go through some sort of tumbling, we land on our head wrong, we tackle in football, we go through combat sport, um, that dens can now impair. It's at that high up, it's brainstem. 
Um, so, but our, our athletes, uh, and actually I've had a handful of athletes with down syndrome and they've all dislocated their patellas playing baseball. I, the three, two of the patients that I've had, um, have had that. That's why I always see. Uh, so that's what tone is. And there's a lower tone disorder. There are intellectual deficits, motor and speech delays. And I hate how the book put this, but general clumsiness, uh, Feels like we should come up with a better word than just saying like, hey, your kid's clumsy, but I haven't thought of one yet. Um, so I will also say uh, every PD, PT and PTA loves working with kids with uh, anybody with Down syndrome because they're generally just really happy people. And that's it's a real joy to be around them. Um, I believe it's Jamie Foxx's, who's an actor. I don't know if you know. Not, uh, he hasn't been in the movies in a little while, so I don't know if you know who that is. Um, I believe his sister has Down syndrome. And he. I read some article about him, and, and he said something along the lines of, everybody comes up to me and meets her and says, oh, I'm so sorry, Jamie. And he goes, why? She's happy every single day. I'm not happy every day. Like, you know, so um, generally really joyful to be. I've never met uh, someone with Down syndrome that isn't just great to be around. Um, so anyway, so our treatment for somebody with Down syndrome, of course, motor milestone acquisition is going to be the pro probably the primary thing we're seeing these people for um, because they will have significant motor delays. They're going to walk. It's just going to take a long time for them to walk. Um, also, balance and coordination and just overall fitness can be important, especially cardiovascular fitness for this population. There are a bunch of other pediatric conditions that I'd love to have time to talk about. Um, you know, I, I'll just go through some of the more commonly common ones. Muscular dystrophy. There's a few different types of muscular dystrophy. Uh, it is lifelong and progressive. What's typically heart wrenching about this is you have a normal, I shouldn't say normal. I think the, the more common term is typically developing child um, up until roughly the age of three. And then they get worse and worse and worse um, up until uh, lifelong expectancy for different types of dystroph muscular dystrophies. Um, somewhere between the mid 20s is about what the life expectancy is. Um, Cystic fibrosis, that is a lung disorder that uh, is lifelong and also progressive. Um, lots of mucus develops in the lungs, requires a lot of the um, treatments that are similar to COPD. You guys remember what those treatments were for COPD? Postural drainage is the number one thing I was thinking of, but also the vibration and tapping on the the chest to help try to clear secretions. Lots of that for cystic fibrosis. Autism spectrum disorder, um, lifelong and static, but social symptoms begin to appear around two. And spina bifida, there's a few different severities of spina bifida with special names to it. Um, lifelong and static as well. That's a neural tube development disorder that starts within the first three weeks of um, of uh, development in the womb. That that's when that happens. So, um, so those are the, some of the more common ones you might see floating around out there. Um, just wanted to kind of bring your attention to that. Any questions on pediatrics? All right. So now let's flip to the other end of this the um, age spectrum, geriatrics. Typically thought of as adults over the age of 65. Um, really important for us because by 2035, there'll be more older adults over the age of 65 than children, which is a pretty crazy thing to think of. Um, and if you're looking at Social Security or Medicare or anything else like that, that's a terrible problem to have. Um, but we'll let your economics professors discuss that more um 
I will say it's important to avoid stereotypes. So I'm going to try to use the term older adults, probably a little bit better taken than geriatrics or elderly. Because I will also say um, I have some amazing older adults that would run circles around people under the age of 65. Um, so, but the stereotypes that we could have, if we just look at somebody's age, we don't want to dismiss them to give them a lower prognosis than they might, might want to have or a lower expectance for independence or activity. Um, I've had the, I, when I was typing this up, I had an 85 year old that played tennis three times a week. And um, I've had my oldest patient I ever had, was a 63 year old that drank smoke rough life all of her life and she was the oldest person i've ever treated and i kept thinking we we made an error in our system like somebody somebody put in her birth date 30 years i was off by 30 years if you were to look at this woman you would guess she was 30 years older than what she actually was um she was older than my oldest patient, who was 130, function, physically-wise. Um, so, so that's where we, we should really start look at uh, more about that person rather than just their age. I think that's, that's what I'm trying to say. So broad treatment goals with geriatrics. As people live longer and longer, we will acquire a variety of conditions that will impact our function. Could be uh, high blood pressure, could be a, uh, osteoarthritis, could be a lot of different things. Um, there are biological changes with aging. Decreased muscle mass, decreased power, lower aerobic capacity. If you're interested in sports at all, you can just look at uh, different age categories and swimming times or track and field times and distances. As we age, we get a little bit slower and a, a little bit less power. That's okay. That's typical aging. What's not typical is decline in function. That is not a typical consequence of aging. But if we have a sedentary lifestyle, that dramatically changes how this biological decreased power and, and strength can play into a person's function. Um, so the most important PT goals involve improving and preserving ADLs. So ADLs are activities of daily living. I know we cover this. I think back in week one, we covered ADLs. Um, there are two different major categories of ADLs. There's basic ADLs and then instrumental. Basic ADLs include bed mobility, transfers, toileting, bathing, grooming, dressing, feeding, really anything that you would need to do to live. And then there are instrumental ADLs, shopping, housekeeping, managing your finances, use of transportation, whether you transport yourself or you use uh, public uh transportation you know how are you going to get around uh now basic adls are required every single day round the clock uh instrumental are less so they're they're typically more cognitively challenging um but also less frequent so what's important about this especially if we work in the hospital or skilled nursing facility is can this person go home? Well, if they need help with their basic ADLs, can that person go home? The broad answer would be no, with exceptions to the rules of, well, oh, but my daughter lives here and she doesn't work and she can take care of me. All right, wow, I can't believe you wrangled that living setup. That's pretty good for you. Good. Um, how about instrumental ADLs? If a person could handle their basic ADLs, but not their instrumental, could they go? It depends. Give me more information on it depends because that's the right answer. Can somebody make up for these? 
taking care of pets is an instrumental EDL. Um, dogs are a little bit more frequent. I, I, a lot, I will tell you a lot of my geriatric, oh, I'm sorry, older adults. Yeah, I immediately did it. Older adults, um, they transition to birds as pets. How often does uh, dogs need care? Every handful, of, you know, daily, twice a day at a minimum, they need to be let out. How about cats? Feeding it, changing the litter box. Depends on how many cats you have. I've been in some houses. There's a whole lot of cats. Um, but one cat, you know, once a week, you know, fine. Birds? Yeah, fill up the seed and then you change the paper on the bottom of it every now and again. It's, it's pretty low maintenance. Um, anyway, let's say, let's use me. If I had a family member living 12 hours away, they said, Josh, we, I want to get home. How do I get home? I just can't manage my instrumental ADLs. Could I, from 12 hours away, set them up with some sort of shopping? Could I do their shopping for them? They get it delivered. I could, right? Could I hire a housekeeper to swing in once a week, every other week to clean the place up? Yep. Could I order an Uber for them when they need one? Or, I mean, there's other transportation options too. Could I hire a CPA to manage their finances? Yeah, I could do all that from however many hours away I could be. If they needed help toileting, could I be 13 hours away and help them? No, that's a different thing, right? So that's the difference between instrumental and basic ADLs. Um, so our goal is just to maintain that independence with your ADLs as long as possible. Other treatment considerations might be modifying the environment to improve function. Uh, that could include mechanical recliners. How many uh, parents or grandparents have these mechanical recliners? So you press a button and it stands up for them. Yeah, pretty good. Um, one of the easiest things I do is I lower the plates and glasses from the top of the cabinets to just on the counter. Now we don't have to reach up and, you know, lift up these heavy plates way outside of our reach zone, especially, um, my great aunt, she was, how, how tall was she when she, she was like four foot seven. She has such a, she has such a, a kyphotic posture. She was about four foot seven. She was, she was using a step ladder to get her plate out of the, the cabinet. Uh, stubborn Irish woman, uh, through and through, um, Aunt Darlene, we're just going to put this on the counter and just leave it on the counter. It doesn't need to go in the cover. Just put it on the counter. Um, now you're not climbing on a stupid step ladder at 94 years old, four foot seven, trying to. Um, so that's the kind of simple modification of the environment it might take. Um, adding of gate devices, walkers, canes, adding safety bars. I will also say adding lighting is one of the first things I do. And one of the first things I suggest if, if your loved ones are aging, um, adding lighting is so important because our vision is slowly declines over time. Uh, and I got to tell you, my patients, when they have to, the one of the top mechanisms of fall is at night, slightly disoriented, house lights are off, and they're trying to walk to the bathroom and don't see the pathway appropriately. So adding night lights or leaving a hallway light on so they have a little bit better lighting is uh, really, really helpful. So we've got a bunch of uh, tests we can do to measure. First up, uh, the big ones is uh, balance, our walking ability gait, and then ADLs is the next thing. So with balance, we can do a Romberg test. So everybody uh, stand on up. For everybody in this room, unless you know you have balance problems, uh, stay with your feet in a standard position. If you know you've got solid balance, put your feet right in front of one another. All right, now stand without touching anything with your eyes open.
So standing like this, this is the sharpened Romberg if you want to be technical. So this is eyes open. And we can look around the room. I'm sure you guys feel just a slight sway. All right, now let's do this. Shut your eyes. Anybody touch their desk already? All right, so that is Romberg. Now, standard Romberg is just, hey, stand here, eyes open, eyes closed. To make it a little bit more challenging, we shorten the basis of work to make it a little bit more challenging. Um, so that is our Romberg test. So, and that's actually a good test to highlight the importance of vision, right? So what was the difference? How many people uh, started wobbling as soon as they shut their eyes, right? Did your balance change at all? Your bit... Why did it change? We took away what? Not coordination, we're not moving at all. Took away our vision. So our vision plays such an important role in balance that if we take it away, we are at higher risk of falls. What's happening as we age to our eyes, by the way? Getting worse over time. Maybe we never need a glass, but all of a sudden we do. What happens at night? Do I throw on my glasses when I'm walking to the bathroom? Most of the time, no. The lights in the house are off. So I ha I'm not using my, my vision sense, my sensory input of vision to help with my balance. And I'm stumbling to the bathroom. Big risk for falls. That's why lighting is so important. But anyway, that was Romberg test. We could also look at the functional reach test. So it was pretty fun. So we put up a, a ruler on the wall. And we say, okay, patient, start here. You're starting at zero. How far can you reach forward and then return safely? That's one of my favorite tests to do. Because uh, another common mechanism of fall is reaching into the refrigerator. Especially if we're using a walker. Because now the walker's in the way. And I have to reach up and over the walker. And I have to really reach outside of my base of support. So that functional reach test is really nice. Um the Berg test is a little bit more in-depth. There's 14 different tasks we ask our patient to do. Stand up, sit down, turn in a circle, all a bunch of different tasks, 14 different tasks. And then we get to grade the patient on a one to four scale. What's great about this is at the end of the Berg, we get a number that is, uh, okay, your Berg score was a 28. That indicates that you're a moderate risk of falls. Let's do all these exercises for a few weeks, and then we'll retest you, and we'll compare what the scores are. So I love the Berg. Um, one of the more important ones is gait speed. So gait speed is just exactly how fast are you walking. Um, you need at least 0.6 meters per second to be considered a limited community ambulator. 1.0 is considered normal. Um, every single insurance wants me to discharge my patients. They want me to discharge my patients before I even see them because they don't want to pay, right? Uh, we talked about that a handful of weeks ago. I tell them they cannot be discharged to outpatient yet or they're not safe to leave the home. And I tell them what their gate speed is. We started, they were at, Point, I've had some patients 0.2 meters per second. They're just crawling. Um, I had a guy yesterday I tested. He was uh, 0.38 meters per second. Why can't we transition out patient yet? Because it's not a community, limited community ambulator. We need to be 0.6 meters per second. We'll work on it. And I can measure it over time and say, well, we started at 0.2. Now we're at 0.4. We're going to get close to that 0.6. So um, that's one of my favorite measures right there. We could also do the six minute walk test. How long do you think that lasts for? <laughs> Seven minutes. Uh, six minute walk test takes six minutes to do. Um, the formal way to do it is to have a 30 meter course and then we measure how far could the patient walk in six minutes. They can take as many rest breaks as they want, but it's a good endurance test uh, for them. Uh, the timed up and go is a great one. Because what we have our patient do is we have our patient start in a chair. We mark on the ground. We give them a little line. We, 
that's three meters away, and we say, okay, patient, when I say go, I'm going to time you. You're going to get up, and you're going to go, right, timed up and go, now, to that line, turn around and come back, timer stops as soon as you sit down. Ready, go. Stand up, walk to the line, they turn around, they walk back, then they sit down, boom, time stops. So what I love about this test is I'm also testing their ability to get up out of a chair, which can be really tough. How many people, when you go out to maybe at Thanksgiving, go out to dinner or something, you have a older adult as a family member and they need a couple of attempts. How many family members take the, the, the three rock and then stand up test, right? So what I love about the timed up and go is all of that gets incorporated into this test where the Romberg, I'm not able to test that um so anyway that's a great test um other so the other thing is that uh adls barthel is the common one uh now this one the caregiver whatever that might could be a family member it doesn't have to be us we have 10 different items of adls rate how independent they are at the end of it we get a number we get to track that over time there's also a patient questionnaire. There's a patient questionnaire for every single problem you could ever have. Um, but the activities of daily living questionnaire, I, you guys, if you've been a patient, you've been given a questionnaire of some kind, right? And then at the end of that questionnaire, usually it's tallied up as a score. Oh, you're a 22 in this topic we wanted to talk about. Um, so that's that questionnaire. All right. Um, any questions on measuring with older adults? So the next thing we want to talk about, first up, we'll talk about osteoporosis. So this is decreased mineralization of bone, decreased bone mass. What do you think the problem with that is if we have decreased bone mass? Fragile, fragile, fragile bones, fragile bones. We're going to get fractures. Um, it is a progressive and lifelong condition. Now, I will say, jumping down to this special note, women over 50 are at the greatest risk of developing osteoporosis uh, due to some uncontrollable risk factors. One, menopause, lots of hormonal changes. Other big one is they start with lower bone mass to begin with. Men have bigger, thicker bones. Um, but there are also some controllable risk factors we could look at. Nutrition, especially vitamin D and calcium, uh, minimizing smoking and drinking alcohol, and then exercise. Exercise is a great way to either slow the progression or prevent entirely osteoporosis. The type of exercise should be light impact, though. Light impact and weightlifting are the two that we should be using. And that's one thing. If we were to get together with our our active older adults, what do they always think their exercise should be? Oh, yeah. so we would tell them, yes, let's go for a run. We would tell them, let's go weight lift because that's going to help improve bone mass. But what do you think most of our older adults want to do? No, well, nothing, but swimming or no impact. How many older adults do you see say, oh, it's so great because it's no impact. I'm going to use the the glider or the elliptical machine because it's no impact. No, we want impact. Like it, So that is the number one thing we have to educate our patients on is you need impact. We want you to walk on asphalt. We want you to run. We want you to do step aerobics. We don't want you just jumping in the pool. Pool is great exercise no matter what you do. Ex all exercise is good, but not to prevent osteoporosis. We want impact. and We want load with weightlifting to help. Why is weightlifting going to help? with uh, improved bone mass, or at least slow progression. So more important than muscle for this case is the muscle pulls on the bone. What do we know about Wolf's Law? It's going to, bones are going to grow a bit placed on the forces it's placed upon. So if we add more force, it's going to grow. Yeah, so we're going to prevent additional decline. 
Um, anyway, so that's a special note. So our treatment is to promote weight bearing exercise, to promote light active, light impact. I think going to the trampoline park might be a little bit too crazy, but doing step aerobics is perfect. Um, resistance training can also be beneficial, but also balance exercises are a must. I don't care if a patient comes to me because of shoulder pain. If I see that they have osteoporosis, I'm adding balance. Why is balance so important for someone with osteoporosis? Why is that? If that's exactly right, if they fall, they are going to break something. So we are going to start working on prevention of falls before they ever, ever have any sort of balance problem. We are going to start treating that now before, so you don't fall. Um, really, really important. So let's say we didn't do a good job. They do fall. So hip fractures, the next one. Femur, typically the femoral neck, if you know your anatomy. Uh, mechanism is typically a fall onto the ground. Static problem, hopefully temporary. For most people, it is. You go in, fix it. Some fragile health-wise, it can be a real tragedy. Um, so our treatment is typically these patients are going to have surgery, and we're going to manage the post-surgical rehab. Early mobilization, transfer training, gait training, balance training, looking at environmental changes, uh, adding lighting, I've talked about a couple of times. Medications can have a huge uh, role into your fall risk, especially if it's blood pressure medicine. That can be a huge thing. Um, use of assistive devices, footwear. Throw rugs in home are a huge tripping hazard. One of the first things I do is I look at throw rugs and say we really should be uh, eliminating these. Um, lack of safety bars. Pets can also be a, a fall risk. Um, so you know, environmental to modify the environment so we have less risk factors in the home, but also treatment to uh, make the patient more mobile. Now, I will also say just to highlight how important it is to prevent falls in our older adults. Falls uh, falls are responsible for 90% of hip fractures in adults of the age of 65. So odds are if you have a hip fracture, it's because you fell. They are Falls are responsible for 25% of all hospital admissions. So one out of every four people that wind up spending overnight in the hospital is because of a fall. 40% of skilled nursing facility admissions. So almost half the people in a skilled nursing facility are there because of a fall. And a quarter of those people admitted to a skilled nursing facility because of a fall will die within a year. Now, it's not always because of the fall, like their health was so fragile, their, their functioning was low already that caused the fall. It's not specifically because of the fall. But if you already have low functioning, you already have poor mobility, what's going to happen after a hip fracture and a surgery? It plummets, and it's going to take a lot of work to get it back up, and we just might not. You might just have a lower functioning, drastically lower functioning for the remainder of your days. Um, so it's a huge, huge problem. Other common problems that I just wanted to mention, Parkinson's disease, I bet you is something you've heard a lot about. Uh, Parkinson's disease is getting diagnosed early and earlier on. Uh, dementia and then compression fractures. Uh, you know the number one mechanism of compression fractures? Did I talk about this at all? Church pews. Church pews. So the mechanism is actually uncontrolled descent into a chair. How many older adults can we think of in our lives? Parents or grandparents, great aunts, great uncles, whoever it might be that sit down exactly like that, right? That, that plop into a chair. Um, it's not so bad when it's your recliner. It's pretty drastic when it's that hard pew and he's doing that, you know, um, that, that jolt that what, what that, especially if we combine it with osteoporosis, it just, there's so much force compressing into that that the vertebral bodies create these little uh, compression what fractures. What's that? Not on compression fractures. But if yeah, if oh it happens a ton. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have exact I'm percentages. Yeah, yeah. He's got a lot of work to do in his his churches. Um but yeah that's the um common one for old other adults now again i just wanted to touch on this um 
we are mandated reporters when it comes to elder abuse. Elder abuse can uh, be the form of neglect, not taking care of our, our older adults. Could be emotional, psychological, or physical abuse. And also, this one happens. I think this is the most common one, but I don't have exact statistics on it. Uh, financial exploitation is a huge problem. Um, and abuse is common both in homes and in skilled nursing facilities. Up to half the people with dementia have been mistreated. Uh, so that's that's a drastic thing that we should always be on the lookout for. Yeah. 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 I, that um, so over medicating patients is a huge problem um, because the staff doesn't want to work so hard. Like, quiet that guy down. Here's the medication. He's unruly. We need more meds. That definitely. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 good for you. Yeah, that definitely happens. Um, so anyway, that's the end of that. Do we have any questions on pediatrics or geriatrics? All right, let me pause this. We'll do a little more.